Right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning uh, to each one of you. Good morning to those who are online. Um, all right. So let's just begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we will start uh, with the teaching. Uh, maybe one of us can pray. Any one of us like to pray? Feel free to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you very much for bringing us all here together today for this prayer, for this uh, understanding of your word, Father. Please help Pastor Paul, Heavenly Father, to help us understand him better, Heavenly Father, and help us reveal new things to him, Heavenly Father, and bless each and every person present here, Heavenly Father. And thank you very much for giving us all the opportunity to learn and understand more about your word, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so we've been talking about... Uh, the teacher, uh, the evangelist, sorry, we we completed the evangelist, right? We say quite a lot from there. So this class, we're going to move into the teacher, right? So like we spoke about it last week, being a teacher is completely different from being uh, an evangelist or a, or a pastor or a, a prophet and all of those things, right? A teacher requires a lot of training a lot of preparation right it's not something that we can just come and teach in an hour or so uh, teachers usually spend if you look at you know uh, uh, me growing up my parents were teachers right? and i remember my you know, as a little boy my you know my parents would get those answer sheets and even after coming back home they would prepare for their next uh, next day class, right? And they would spend a lot of time uh, preparing. So a teacher's role is an exciting role uh, because when a teacher is speaking into a child's life, a person's life, um, those those seeds can last for a long, long time, right? Uh, I remember when I was in school, there was this teacher who, you know, all the other teachers would say, you know, you're, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. But there was this one teacher in my class, uh, uh, in my school, that he always looked at me differently. She always said, okay, he, he, he's not, not, may not be good in studies, but he's good in other things. He's good in five other things rather than maybe, you know, not good in, may not be good in studies. And I remember this teacher and I even now meet with him. Why? Because he really helped me. The thing is, while well, growing up, I remember we, we used to watch a lot of English, right? So I forgot what my mother tongue was. I, I couldn't speak my mother tongue, right? Uh, so it was always English at home. So this teacher would say, okay, Paul, you know, you, you, you don't like maths. You don't like all of those other science and all those other subjects. You're good in English. Why don't you, you know, you go and talk in English and you, you go on stage and speak in English and write essays in English. So... So, you know, teachers have an, a way of impacting people. Now, we look at the Lord Jesus and the ministry that he did when he taught people, right? So, we're going to look at it. Uh, the teacher and how Jesus set an example. Now, plenty of places in Jesus' ministry, you see him teaching the word of God. Can you give me some examples? Anyone would like to give me some examples? Those online? Examples where the Lord Jesus taught there was a proper teaching. Sorry, in the temple. Go ahead. Yeah, Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount. Okay, very good. What else? About kingdom, about the kingdom of God. Yes. So all of these places, Jesus is teaching. Right now, let's look at a few examples, right? Now, the best example will be in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, right? And in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus speaks of many, many topics, right? So if you, if you open Matthew chapter 5, go to Matthew chapter 5. Now, we can't read the whole chapter, but look at what, how it's broken up there. First one, he says, he speaks a blessing. He says, these are the things. In the natural, what will happen to you? Blessed are the poor in the spirit. Uh, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who, 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 blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. And then he goes on to say, you're standing. He says, you are the light of the world. Right? Oh. Then he says, you are the salt of the earth. Then he talks about the law in verse 17 onwards. 
Then he talks about murder, talks about adultery, divorce, oaths, eye for an eye. And then he goes on for to love your enemies. So you see this entire sermon is, is it's called a sermon, but it's more of a teaching where the Lord Jesus is teaching. Let's read Matthew chapter 4. We'll pick up a few verses and we'll read them. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23. Yes, could one of us read that? Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing and all kind of sickness and all kind of disease among the people. Mm. Jesus went about doing what? Throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. See, it's followed by teaching, preaching, and healing. Right? Three things. Teaching, preaching, and healing. Right? Okay, let's look another look at another portion here. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 2. Again, from the uh, Sermon on the Mount. I'll read that. Matthew 5 verse 2. And he began to teach them, saying... Blessed are you, uh, blessed are the poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he goes on to uh, begin that whole sermon on teaching. Right? Let's look at another example. Mark chapter 4 and verse 1. Could be a repeated, but it's all right. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. The parable of the sower. Mm. Can you read that again? For the, uh, Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 1. Once again, Jesus began to teach by the lake shore. Yeah. A very large crowd soon gathered around him. So what? he got. Yeah, that'll, that'll do. So again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. Mark 1 21. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. Yeah. So if you go on, we'll see a lot of examples where Jesus went and he taught. He began to teach them. Right? Now, uh, we, we talked about this briefly last class, right? There's a big difference between teaching and preaching. When we teach people, we go into details. Right? We go into the the main point that you want to bring a, bring across is is uh, you know it is more explicit it's it's explained more right and jesus did that he he began to teach the people let's look at a few examples of the nature of jesus's teaching method how did he teach now if you and i if God is calling us to teach maybe many of us are going to be pastors and leaders or you want to teach what is the nature? Let's look at Christ's example. How did he teach? Right? What is the method of his teaching? First one. One of the principal features of Christ's teaching was authority. When Jesus taught, he taught in authority. Now, what, what, what is it with authority? Authority is when you know what you're doing, when you know you're standing. Right? If you look at a, a man, a CEO, of a company, when he's entering his company, is he going to ask, can I enter in? Or is he going to say, where is my swipe card? All of that don't matter to him. He's just going to enter. He's the boss. He's the CEO, right? Authority. Jesus knew he, he who he was. He knew he was the son of God. He knew he was the Messiah. He knew what he could do. And when Jesus spoke, he spoke in authority. Now, what did Jesus say? In the, uh, he said, I am giving you the authority. Yes, did Jesus say that? Yes or no? Yeah. He said, I'm giving you the authority. You go and teach what I have told you, you know, what I've, I've taught you. Now, let's look at a few examples. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 24. Let's read that. Matthew 5 and 24. Again, this is in between the Sermon on the Mount. Leave your gifts, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Mm. Right? Now Jesus is talking about murder. Now, interestingly, he's not 
it's it, it is not only the physical murder but he's talking also about times when a brother and a sister or two two believers are not talking to each other there's unforgiveness what is jesus saying 23 says therefore if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you go leave it reconcile with your brother come back and give your offering now this is a stern important teaching right now why is it important right now you and i don't go to give any offerings right but during this time remember it was still the old covenant they were doing all the sacrifices all the offerings that were being done in the temple jesus is saying if it's not only about murder but even if you have something against your brother or your sister there's unforgiveness in your heart there's no point of the offering so i'm sure those who are reading it or hearing this so oh these are the people that i have things against jesus is saying go reconcile with them then come and give your offering next one he says in matthew chapter 15 and verse 4 let's read that sorry 15 verse 14 matthew 15 and verse 14 Let, let them alone, they are blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind leads the blind, mm. both will fall into a ditch. Okay, now who is he talking about? In the beginning of the, yeah, he's talking about the Pharisees. In the beginning of the chapter, Jesus is talking about clean and unclean. What is clean, what is unclean? And he's telling the, his followers, leave those Pharisees alone. Because they are blind leading the other blind. Now, is that a strong teaching? Wow. What else does he say? Many places he says, I am the bread. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. Jesus didn't feel afraid. He spoke in authority. He says, I am before Abraham was. That was the best. <laughs> right? Before Abraham was, I am. Then he goes on to say, if you destroy this temple, I will rebuild it in three days. So nowhere is Jesus being afraid when he's teaching. And the best part of his ministry, when we see that Jesus went to the temples and the synagogues and taught. And even though his message was stern, people came to hear him. Right? So maybe some of us, you know, while teaching, we may be stern. It's nothing wrong. Sternness with love is all right. Right? If I, if I love my children, I'm going to be stern with them, right? Uh, I have to be stern and because I love them. I have to correct them. I have to teach them. Just because they are pastors, children doesn't mean they know everything. Doesn't mean they're angels, right? They have to learn. They have to learn what God's word. They have to learn even how to live, right? So every morning I, I tell my children, this is what you are. This is what you have to do you have the choice now we are here my children are in school i don't know what they're learning in school but they have the choice right so i keep telling them we keep telling them as parents so the lord jesus is doing that he he's teaching and he's being stern out of love right and another example would be in uh, luke chapter 10 right in luke chapter 10 is it's an amazing story Jesus, you know, he sends out the 12. He feeds, uh, he feeds the 5,000 people, right? And in Luke chapter 10, he sends out 72 people. He says, go and do ministry. The best part after that is he's teaching the people and the Pharisees, the Jews, everyone around, the Sadducees, the scribes, all the great men are there around. What is he saying? The parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, if any other Jew, if a religious Jew was there, he would have stopped Jesus. No, no, no. You correct that. There is no Good Samaritan. The parable of the Samaritan is fine. No Good Samaritan. But you see, Jesus, what an example. See, when, when you and I are reading it, we're a Good Samaritan. Right? 
that is why it's very important to understand when we're reading scripture what is the context what is the context when he says good samaritan it's like saying these samaritans are better than the jews in the story and the jews hate the samaritans but jesus is putting across that one one you know one pharisee one high priest is going one pharisee is going one good man is going nobody is helping the person who has been beaten up but a samaritan is coming and helping now the listeners are thinking what is this man talking about how can a samaritan how can jesus support the samaritan more than the jews but they got the point jesus was not looking at external qualities and external appearance you can be a jew you can be a gentile you can be whatever you want but this is christ likeness this is god's love and the samaritan went took this person put him in the hotel helped him got him restored and so when a person who is jewish listens to it it doesn't set their uh, it, it doesn't settle well in their heart but the best part about jesus is teaching is he didn't worry about what people would think why because he spoke in authority he knew what he's preaching he knew what he's teaching when you and i are teaching right when we're teaching the scriptures be assured of what you're teaching you be convinced you be convicted <clears throat> now many years back i got invited to a youth Uh, another church a, a youth meeting right? so they said why don't you come and teach and but this church didn't believe in the holy spirit and they didn't believe i mean they believed in the holy spirit but they didn't believe in the gifts of the holy spirit and i knew it so the topic i chose was gifts of the holy spirit right and now whether they like it they don't like it that is not my i'm not worried about that whether they'll call me or not after that i don't know whether they'll call me and they'll start saying why you spoke about all this that i don't know but when i'm teaching i'm teaching on the gifts of the spirit i will teach on authority because i'm not making up my own stories and i'm teaching the gifts of the spirit which is there in the bible and those gifts are still functioning and there are verses and there are scriptures and the holy spirit is there he is releasing it he is building the church it's still going on if you don't believe doesn't mean i will not teach that's what jesus did so you don't believe i'm the messiah but i'm telling you i'm the messiah you don't believe in what whatever i'm saying but i believe it think about the parables he's talking about the kingdom of god kingdom of god is like this like this is they may not believe it the listeners but jesus knew what he's teaching right so there will be times when you will be invited to go teach uh, in places or preach uh, yes we have to be sensitive but speak in authority right jesus did that what is yes let's use the mic yeah i think you shouldn't your age also matter when you're uh, speaking like topics like this like for for your you have is the age of maybe 30 plus or something so you can go preach about certain topics like this mm. when it comes to me my age i'm uh, around 19 now so if i go preach topics like this or someone even younger than me go preach topics like this people mm. might have a hard time accept because coming mm. from a, a, a young p- a person is what i'm saying yeah so that is true but yeah. again see the what does the bible say Paul writes and he says for the gospel is the power of god unto salvation right it is not the person can be anybody you you not need you not be a learned person to go and teach right it can be anyone so you're saying you're 19 look and you if you are convinced about a certain thing right you are convinced that jesus died on the cross now there'll be millions of people who don't who are not convinced right but you are convinced you can go and teach it doesn't matter your age age is uh, what does paul write to timothy he says timothy you don't look at your age look at the anointing the anointing will make the difference people will listen to you mm. 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 
Yeah, so life experience, see, uh, like I said, right, last week, last class, see, in ministry, we learn practically as we, as years go by, we learn, say, okay, hey, I should speak in a certain way. I should address people in a certain way. I should be polite. I should, this is the way I should talk. Then people will come, you know, initially I was very young, right? People will come and tell, I have marriage, I have a problem around marriage. Now I'm not married. I don't know what to tell them. What do I tell them? Right? But they're coming and asking me. I was 25 years old. So, my, you know, my husband is doing this. My wife is doing this. I said, I'll pray for you. <laughs> That's all I can say. I can't. But now, over time, I can share. Okay, so you do this or you do this. You know, this, this can help you. And then sometimes people used to come before when I was young. They would say, you know, my children are troublemakers. They are doing this and doing that. I'm not able to control my children. What do I do? I don't know, but now I'm able to give some kind of input. So, uh, so ministry over time, we will learn and we will learn from our mistakes as well. All of us will make mistakes and we will learn from it. So it's the anointing is there. The anointing is resting on God's word. So, so you don't worry about age. You don't worry about the way we speak. Paul says that, right? And the apostle Paul says, I did not go with my own eloquence of speech, but I went preaching the gospel, lest the power of the cross be nullified. I went preaching. The Apostle Paul could, uh, you know, he had everything with him, but he said, I preach the gospel. So it's, it's, yes, we may feel insecure. I understand where you're coming from, right? Because you've got people who are much elder to you. They've been in ministry for 30 years, 40 years. Now, remember, age does not mean, greater in age does not mean greater in revelation. You can have a 15-year-old boy with the greater revelation of God than a person who is 15 years in the Lord, who's reading the same thing. You get what I'm saying, right? So it's it's not about the age. It's about the anointing. It's about God's call in our life, right? Of course, we respect them. Yeah, we honor them. They're elder to us. They may not know everything. We may know much more than them, but still we respect them because they are our brothers or their fathers and mothers in the kingdom of God. Uh, so that we must maintain. Right? <clears throat> okay. Another feature of uh, Christ's teaching was the method that he used was love. Right? Wherever the Lord Jesus preached, taught, and wherever he went, it was out of love. Jesus did not teach just because... Um, you know, he wanted to teach. He didn't have anything to do. Carpentry business was down. No. He taught them expecting their lives to change. He taught them because he loved them. Right? Uh, this love was exemplified in John chapter 8, verse 1 through 11. Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8, on the Mount of Olives, the Lord Jesus is teaching. Can we read that portion? John chapter 8, 1 through 11. John chapter 8, 1 to 11. Uh, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had seen her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, and they might have something to which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he, ra he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let them throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. The, and Jesus was left alone, 
and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Amen. What a powerful encounter. What a powerful encounter. Now, let me give you a context of this chapter. In the previous chapter is the Feast of the Tabernacles. Jesus' brothers are saying, hey, you like to teach, you like to preach, all of that. No, You go to the feast. Why are you here in Jerusalem and in, in the house? Right? Why are you near the house teaching and doing all this? You go to the feast. You go there, you teach, you do what you want there. Because his own disciples, uh, sorry, his own brothers did not believe him. Right? So Jesus goes there and the Pharisees and the Sadducees knew that he was going to come. So on the last day of the uh, Feast of the Tabernacles, they had planned to trap him. Okay, And if you read on, it says that the, the Jews and the Pharisees, uh, the, the temple guards, uh, they could not trap Jesus. So they go to the Pharisees and the Pharisees ask him, hey, where's Jesus? Why didn't you catch him? And the Pharisees, these temple guards say, no, he was speaking with authority. We could not hold him. Now, this is the second attempt to get Jesus to say something wrong. Right? So they bring this woman and they say, she's caught during the act of adultery. Now, what is adultery in the Old Testament? Remember, this is the Old Covenant. What happens when, we, uh, when there is adultery in the Old Covenant? Sorry, I think, uh, was it on mute? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. So, so in this entire portion, right, uh, so we see that the Lord Jesus spoke in love. He was able to restore the person back to their, to their rightful place. So Jesus, you see that, right? He, he didn't condemn that woman. He didn't say, okay, you go and do what you have to do. Fulfill the law. But his teaching here was very simple. Restore the woman. I don't know. None of your condemners are here, nor do I condemn you. When you and I are called to teach people, yeah, I, I, I would also like to share this. Now, as a teacher, you must also be willing to, or you must also love to do what you're doing. Right? You must be passionate about it. Was Jesus passionate about what he was doing? Definitely he was. Right? It's not easy to stand and keep talking with no mic system. It's not easy. I'm sure Jesus would have had a tired sermon. Imagine the Sermon on the Mount. After that whole sermon, he would have been tired. Now there's no, you know, energy drinks and all at that time. He would have been really tired, right? But there was passion that was driving him. When you and I are called to ministry, let passion drive you. Be passionate about what you're doing, right? Now, I, I want to share this because, you know, being in ministry, initially, we're very passionate. Yes? We want to do everything that comes our way. I'll do the setup, I'll do the ushering, I'll do the preaching, the worship, everything I'll do. But over time, what happens? It's very easy that we lose our focus, we lose the passion for what we're doing. And that is why Jesus set the example. What did he do? Early in the morning, he would rise up, 
he would go to the mountains all by himself and he would pray. So whether teacher, pastor, evangelist, ushering team, sound and setup team, whatever it is, have your time with God. Don't compromise on that. That's what will keep the passion burning. And that's what the Lord Jesus did. You see the scriptures, he went, he taught. He went to this place, synagogues, and he taught. He went to the mountainside and he taught. Why? I'm sure if you look at his three and a half years ministry, there are times he would have repeated teachings and sermons, obviously. right? He would have gone to different places, repeated it. Sermon on the Mount, I'm sure it's not like one time he would have preached it. He would have gone to different places and also taught it. But it's recorded for us at one time. But he was passionate about it. In our ministry, we must be passionate, right? That passion and love for Jesus, for the gospel, for ministry will really encourage us to do what we want to do. Really, it will, right? Sometimes we may feel like giving up. Did the disciples feel like giving up? They did so much. Even though they were with Jesus, they felt. Sorry, I don't know why the audio keeps going off. I'm, I'm not doing anything. Uh, okay, is I'm not sure if somebody is muting me because I'm not doing anything. Uh, okay, I hope I hope it doesn't happen again. All right. Okay, the third point. Uh, it is Jesus's teaching is characterized by wisdom. Wisdom is very important when we teach. Why do we need wisdom? Knowledge is having it here. Wisdom is the appropriate use of that knowledge. Look at this example. Let's read in uh, Matthew. Is it Matthew 22? Uh, I'm guessing it's Matthew 22. Matthew 22. It's 21. Yeah, Matthew 22 and 21. Let's read 20, uh, uh, let's read from 15 onwards, 15 to 22. Matthew 22, 15 to 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciple with the Herodian, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true. And Teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of man. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Where do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose image is inscription in this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, And therefore, to Caesar the things are Caesar's, and God the things that are God. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. What an amazing thing, no? What an amazing encounter. I like the last verse. When they heard this, they were amazed. <laughs> they were amazed and they left him. We can't cast this guy. So much of wisdom. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. I always, I always, you know, think of this. If I was there, I would have asked the second question. These guys were unprepared. They went, what is the initial verse there? They went out to set a trap on. Jesus, right? But they were not prepared. They were not prepared because they wanted to just trap Jesus. That's all they were. And Jesus said, okay, you're trying to trap me. Jesus knew their evil intent. And he says, whose face do you see on the coin? Caesar's. Give it to Caesar then. What belongs to God, give to God. I was ever said, what belongs to God? Then he would have given one nice t 
teaching about who belongs to God and what belongs to God. Right? But in the end of it, because of the words that he spoke in wisdom, they were amazed and they went away. When you and I ask God for wisdom, you and I have the same wisdom. The spirit of wisdom and revelation is one of the gifts of the spirit. Right? And wisdom can come over time. We can learn. We can develop ourselves. Right? Every day when you pray, you say, God, give me the wisdom to do the right things, to say the right things, to, especially in ministry, you have, people will come up and they'll have a lot of questions. They will have, and you will have a lot of ideas in ministry, whether you have to do it or no, right? And then you have to raise up leaders. You have to find the right leaders. Lord, give me the wisdom to choose the right leaders. Right? The Lord Jesus, he walked in wisdom. When he chose the 12, he knew the 12 people. He knew that they are the 12. Right? What does he pray in, in the early part of Matthew? He says, I thank you for giving them to me. So the Father had revealed it to God to choose these people. Even Judas? Yes. Even Judas. It was the wisdom of God. What is the cross? It is the wisdom of God. It's not... Foolishness is the wisdom of God. When you and I teach, we must be able to teach in the wisdom of God. Ask God to give us revelation, especially when we have subjects like, uh, you know, when, when we're studying the word and we have some strong subjects, we need to go back, look at, you know, context, look at Old Testament, see, uh, especially when we're doing revelations, right? If you're studying revelations, you need the wisdom of God. We'll go back and check. We need to have God's word in one hand and God's world in another hand. Understand world events. What is happening? We need the wisdom. Right? How do we get it? We have to pray and ask God. We must ask God for wisdom. We can never say, I'll do it on my own. We need the wisdom of God. Jesus did it here. Look at the parable of the, uh, the sower in Matthew chapter 13, in the parable of the sower. What a powerful teaching. Matthew 13, just to open Matthew 13. You, of course, we can't read the whole thing. The parable of the sower. Jesus starts this beautiful, beautiful illustration. And what does he say? There was once a man and he's already got the audience. Right? Every day, every single day, I have to tell a story to both my children. And only then they will sleep. They don't care what the story is, but they want <laughs> they want a story. Without that, they don't sleep. They can stay awake the whole night, but they want the story. That a story. And so I tell them a story. Both of them. Two separate stories. They don't want to be in the same story. <laughs> right? They need two separate stories. Because in the story, they they are the main characters. <laughs> you know? So they don't want to be a team. They want to be the main characters. Why? Because stories captivate audiences. Right? So this, this is a habit and it's still there. Right? He's oh, nine years old now. He still wants stories. <laughs> right? Because they captivate them. Jesus captivated his audience by telling stories. Right? Now, this is not storytelling stories, <laughs> like good stories, right? Parables. Look at this parable of the sower. Right? A farmer went out to sow his seed. Now everyone's ear is ah. Oh, Farmer went out. Then what happened? So everyone are waiting. They're listening. <clears throat> and they want to know the story. Beautiful example of wisdom. Getting audiences, captivating them. And will you will you get up and go, oh, Jesus, I just need to go to my house and I'll come back. Can you tell me the story later? No. You will stop everything to listen <laughs> to the end of that story. right? And Jesus spoke in that kind of wisdom. He said the whole story. Disciples didn't understand anything. Then he explained the whole thing to them. Right? Wisdom. Fourth one, he combined his ministry or he combined his teaching with supernatural ministry. That is so important. Imagine Jesus saying, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move and it will move. Jesus is saying it, but he's not doing anything about it. Whatever he said about faith, he did it. 
He said, if you have faith, you can do. All things are possible. Did he do impossible things? Yes. He walked on the water. He calmed the storms. He took five loaves of bread and two fish and he fed the thousands. He combined his teaching with the supernatural. And we must do that as well, right? Especially if we are doing it in church, because this setting is a different setting. But in church, in places, in life groups, cell groups, when you're teaching, right? So, and when you go back to your hometowns, you may have, you know, Bible study groups. Combine it with the supernatural. Teach people about faith. Teach people about supernatural. And begin to, you know, walk in that. Jesus did that, right? He thought, he demonstrated. He thought about forgiveness, he demonstrated it. He demonstrated it even to the cross that he says, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Supernatural. Is it easy to forgive? It's a supernatural thing. It's not natural to forgive. Imagine your, your own people are putting you on the cross, they're killing you, they're murdering you for something that you've not done wrong. And Jesus is saying, forgive them. It's not a natural thing. It's supernatural. So supernatural, not always miracles, but even the regular things, it is supernatural. So you combine your teaching and the ministry with the supernatural ministry. One of the reasons why we always keep the last Sunday of the month as Supernatural Sunday. Why? Because we want to, like three weeks we teach, we want to see it happen. Right? Why do we have supernatural, no, no, the, what is the time? Supernatural hour, yeah, supernatural hour. It is not just, okay, sing songs, no. If it's that, no. You, you need to build it up. You say, God, touch our lives, minister, right? Let healings happen, let miracles happen, let broken hearts be healed. That is supernatural, right? And we have to first believe in the word, trust the word, and ask God to work in it, right? Finally, uh, another way that Jesus spoke was he spoke in a figurative language, which was three, three, three ways here. Metaphors. Metaphors are more of figures of speech, right? Let's read Matthew 16, 11. Matthew 16, 11. Matthew 16, 11. Why can't you understand that I'm not talking about bread? So again, I say, be aware of East of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Mm. This is a, just an example, the East of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? And uh, and also, if you look, he, Jesus said, I am I'm the good shepherd. He was not a shepherd, right? Uh, or, I'm the gate, right? I am the vine and you are the branches. All of these are figures of speech. Right? The second way he spoke was hyperboles. Hyperbole simply means exaggeration, something that is not possible in the natural. Right? Best example, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Hyperbole. Can a camel enter the eye of a needle? No. But it's a hyperbole. Right? But he's trying to put a point across. What is the next one? Another example can be First, don't look at the speck of wood in your in your other in the other person's eye, but look at the log of wood in your own eye. How is can there be a log of wood in our own eye? No. So it's a hyperbole. You get what I'm saying, right? So Jesus used these hyperboles to put a point across, right? And third way was the stories, that is parables. What are parables? An easy way to explain parables, uh, parables are earthly stories with a heavenly meaning, right? And Jesus always spoke in parables for two reasons. Number one reason to speak in parables was to illustrate truth, right? uh, to bring out a point. So if you look at the parable of the lost son, it was to illustrate something. Lostness, lost son, lost sheep, lost coin, illustrate some truth. Another reason why he spoke in parables was to 
to hide the truth from some of them, right? To obscure the truth whose heads and hearts were not yielding. Is this prophetic? Yes. Because when in the Old Testament, Isaiah writes and he says, they will hear, but they will not understand. They have ears, but they could not hear. They had eyes, but they could not see. They had hearts, but their hearts were unyielding. They didn't understand. It was to fulfill prophecy as well. There were probably in, in a hundred Jews listening to Jesus preach, maybe 10 of them received, truly received it. Maybe 90 of them, they just heard it, good story, and they went. Right? So it was not like they received it. So there were two reasons. One is to illustrate truth, one is to obscure the truth because they were hearts were unyielding. Right? And another reason could be also because of uh, to fulfill prophecy. Because in, in prophecy, it says that he will speak uh, in these kind of parables. And he did that. So what kind of parables did uh, do we have time? Yeah. What kind of parables were, did Jesus speak about? Luke 15 talks about three parables. And it talks about all three parables have the same meaning. If we open to Luke 15, The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. Now, all these parables talk about the lostness. Now, if you translate it, if you make, give it an earthly meaning, what does it mean? Something is lost, you find it. But if you translate it to a heavenly meaning, it talks about our heart, how we are lost without God. But when we find God, there's rejoicing, there's restoration. There's redemption. So the Lord Jesus spoke in these parables. And if you see, there are different themes of other parables that Jesus talked about. He talked about forgiveness, generosity. Jesus talked about humility. He talked about judgment, the kingdom. There are kingdom parables, a whole list of kingdom parables. Then he talked about the law, parables on uh, Christ's return, the Lord's return, parables of his mercy, his grace, and parables on prayer. So there are many wide ranges of topics that the Lord Jesus spoke about. I remember we did this when I'm leaving this open to you. Uh, if you'd like, you can do this. But I remember when we were students, we did this whole thing of uh, we divided those parables. We bought a big sheet of paper and we divided the parables and we would uh explain like you know write the parable okay parable of the lost son or the prodigal son and we'd write what are the main contents of it and the takeaway right so maybe you if you'd like you can do that so you have those parables lostness the kingdom parables parables of prayer you can break it down and it'll just help us understand the different ways that the lord jesus uh, ministered and taught his audience right and even when we are teaching uh, and preaching, we can add these parables. These parables captivate audiences, right? Hyperboles, again, figures of speech, exaggerations, hyperboles. You can use all of this, uh, but don't use them unnecessarily in your teaching. Right? If you look at Jesus, he, when he, when he taught, he, he said these hyperboles or figures of speech for a reason. There was a context to it. It's not like somebody went to him and said, uh, tell us something. And then he started saying whatever he feels like. No, there was a context to whatever he spoke. Right. So we see that Jesus was an exemplary teacher. And you and I can, you know, build this, build on our teaching skills, build on this, learn, develop. One example, and I'll close, or uh, one, uh, you know, thing that helped me personally was uh, whether it's preaching and uh, whether it's teaching also, what I do is uh, whenever you know I can, I, I sit, especially the initial days, I would sit in front of the mirror and teach the whole sermon or preach the whole sermon. The, the preaching, I do it every Saturday, two times. I preach the whole sermon in front of the mirror, uh, even now. Uh, yeah, even now. <laughs> even now, two times, full sermon, uh, what to say, how to say it when to say, when to use the example, everything, two times, once in the morning, once in the evening. Um, teaching, not always, but uh, you know, if, if the topic is a little hard, then I do it. 
right? And what happens is it will help us to be confident, to teach in authority, to teach in confidence, right? So you can do that. Uh, probably prepare uh, a sermon or a topic and preach it in front of the mirror, right? All right, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. We will catch up next week. And uh, next class, we will do uh, the teacher in the early church right there. Thank you so much. Have a great week. God bless.